thank you, James. Yes, I have been to space once. Unlike James, I didn't come from there. And, uh... <laughs> right. Um, so what an exciting time. Uh, who is building things? Who's making stuff? Yeah? Good, good. Who's got a business plan? Fewer hands. <laughs> So that's what I wanted to talk about. I want to say, okay, so we're in this incredible creative phase of being able to bring software and hardware together in an entirely new way. Uh, so what's the business model? Right? How's that going to work? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, different kinds of business models and then what we're doing to support what we think are the really powerful business models for this next wave. Um, so. Um, For me, it's really interesting to be looking three to five to ten years ahead. And when you do that, obviously, you take a huge amount of risk. You take a huge amount of risk because the things that you're interested in aren't necessarily obvious to everybody else. But the reason I do that is because of this, right? It takes five to ten years to create an overnight success. I remember when um, the internet kind of became a thing and grand grandparents got email addresses. And uh, they said, wow, this internet thing, you know, it just showed up suddenly everybody has an email address. And obviously it took 20, 30 years of the internet growing and growing and getting better and getting more connected and, 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 and till suddenly it appears to everybody to be just everywhere. And I think IoT is more or less doing that same thing. It's at that inflection point right now. And it's crucial that, that those of you who want to kind of um, be part of that wave get deep into it right now. I think it'll be way too late. In, uh, in 12 months' time. Um, disruption is actually much easier than it looks. You know, you look at, uh, you look at um, uh, companies that have completely dominated a space suddenly, and you wonder how did they do that. Usually, all they do is they ride a wave of change that's happening anyway, right? So we saw the web as one of those wa wa waves of change. Uh, the web was an opportunity for companies, to, for, for, for disruptors to look at established businesses and just say, I want to uh, tackle that industry from a new perspective. I want to change the economics of that industry because of the web. I can do this either because they could reach more people or they could, they could change the business model in some way. Uh, and it's the com combination of a big change that's happening anyway, plus some insight as to what people really want in an industry that allows you to be a disruptor. Um, I think the sequence is the web, mobile, uh, and the Internet of Things. I think the next one will be machine learning and AI. I think those two kind of go together, but I think the next one is going to be machine learning and AI. We're right in the heart of the, of the IoT disruption wave right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about business models. This is a great story. A, a friend of mine called Tim Chen is, a, is the sort of th third son of the family that runs this dynasty in Taiwan, one of the great technology dynasties. And when I met him the first time, he said, you know, I grew up as the third son and I, had no pro I thought I had no prospect of running the family business, which is this giant technology business. He said, and then like to my delight, the family picked me. I couldn't believe it. They picked me to run this technology business. He said, my idiot older brother went off to make dustbins. And then he paused and he said, do you know what the margins on pressed tin are? <laughs> I'm selling a billion transistors for nine cents, right? And my brother is, is making 70% margins on pressed tin. So this is definitely a business model, right? If you, if you, if you are able to capture people's imagination and, and make things that physically they want to have, they want to touch, they want to use, the margins on that can be, can be really good. The challenge with this, of course, is that it's very difficult to imagine conquering 90% of the world market for dustbins at 60 to 70% margins, right? So if your focus is on the physicality, you're almost certainly going to be looking at a, at, a, at a small slice of the market for whatever the thing is, whether it's bicycles, smart bicycles, whether it's television sets, doesn't matter. But physicality doesn't drive a network effect, and without a network effect, you, you, you won't ultimately come to be the, um, the platform play effectively, the, um, the default or de facto standards. But margins on physical things can be pretty good. Most people, I, f I, you know, I recoil from physical uh, thing business models because I think they tend to lead to landfill, right? 
Um, I think that, that when we buy things or when people buy things because of the physicality of them, inevitably, you know, they get swapped out later. So I'm much more interested in, in a different set of angles, uh, and that would be software, right? And the combination of software uh, and hardware is really interesting because if you take something and add software to it, you give it a life, right? The thing that people bought is not the thing that they will still be using in a year's time. You can change the software. And if you can change the software, you can refresh and renew people's engagement with that thing. And so being a software guy, I obviously think software is really, really good. Um, the relationship between hardware and software is also interesting. The technology industry is really interesting. If you look at something like Cisco, I just need to see where I am. If you look at something like Cisco, Cisco's margins on switches are 60%, right? Uh, you can buy exactly the same hardware from someone who will give them to you at 5% margins or 10% margins, right? So why does Cisco command that 60% premium? Because so far, they've managed to convince people that the software interoperability of Cisco with Cisco gives you a premium experience. So one angle on software, uh, the thing that I think is really interesting, is the ability to change the experience. The other angle on software is it does essentially allow you to start to um, create a network effect around, around um, uh, the thing that you're selling. But the angle that I think is particularly interesting is essentially the, the App Store angle. This is, um, this is a quadcopter. There are literally hundreds of people making these things, right? It's very hard to imagine why one of these things would suddenly win the market, right? Because physically, there aren't any barriers to people making more of these, right? The technology is well understood. You can source all the components, etc. What is going to define this market is software, right? And in particular, I don't think it's going to be the software that comes with the drone, right? Uh, there might be some that have a better autopilot, some that have a worse autopilot. But I think the key here is going to be the ability to bring other software to a device like this. And I want to sort of give you a sense of how that might work. So in fact, what's going on here is this is a Raspberry Pi in here, right? Just a plain Raspberry Pi, uh, not a custom motherboard, not a custom no custom silicon, just a Raspberry Pi. And that's then connected up to all of the actuators and whatnot. And there's some software which just flies the drone, right? But the key, I think, is the ability to extend that. So what are we doing with these guys and many others? We're helping them essentially create app stores for their things, right? So what could I do with a drone like this? So I want to show you. I've got um, just a plain little... Uh, uh, a small form factor PC over here. And on that, I've got a, a new version of Ubuntu, which is specifically designed for appliances, devices. And part of what it does is it connects you up to an app store. And so um, what sorts of fun stories might we tell about a drone like this, right? So here I have a device. And on that device, um, I have some apps already installed. Uh, I've got Docker. Um, I've got uh, um, this vid streamer over here, and that's actually connected up to this camera, right? Which is streaming all of you live to the internet. Um, so what, it, what would I have to do if I was a drone manufacturer to get that experience? I'd have to do only one thing. Take a standard USB camera, stick it on my drone, and plug it into that Raspberry Pi, right? Then anybody in the world can just click one button, and pull that app in, allocate that camera to that app, and they've now essentially got a drone that can fly around, take pictures, or, or stream video. So that's kind of cool. Um, what else do we have? Well, this other app over here, Matrix, that's coming from something called Matrix.org. Matrix.org? Matrix.org. Um, who are um, creating a distributed messaging system, right? So this little drone of mine now can fly around and it can act as an endpoint in a distributed messaging system. So I can just go there, 
here's the matrix thing, and I've got an incoming call. Hello, Martin. Right, so just taking a drone, installing one app, and now that thing is a, a messaging endpoint, effectively, right? That means that if it's a sensor or if it's um, responsible for making decisions out in the field, it can now participate in a messaging system and send messages to me. Um, or it can be actually a gateway for me or somebody else to, to make calls. So now we've got a drone that can fly around, take pictures, and essentially participate in a messaging system. So we could fly around the office and be your telepresence system if you, if you wanted it to. Do you see how we take something really simple, just a Raspberry Pi and a standard, essentially, quadcopter body and start to create almost magical stories just by being able quickly to pull different parts of a software ecosystem together around that. So what else could we do? I'm just going to go into the story. There's a new one in here, which is very, very cool. Um, this is Ethereum. So Ethereum, who's familiar with the blockchain? Great. So wouldn't it be cool if your things could make contracts, right? So the classic story of this would be imagine a vending machine where you can go up to that vending machine, wave a phone effectively, and make a contract with that vending machine. Not just to buy a can of Coke, right, or your sugar of choice, but to, for example, get permission to stock that vending machine, right? In other words, you might say, look, I'm bidding on the contract to resupply this vending machine, and you can engage contractually with that through the blockchain effectively. So what we're seeing right now is this really interesting ecosystem bubbling up of people who are starting to think about writing software or producing apps not for one thing, but for many things, right? So, and we've seen this before in the technology industry. It's called disaggregation and, uh, and, and componentization, right? And it always leads to something <coughs> incredible. It leads to a hockey stick of innovation, right? If all of the thinking and all of the design and all of the inventing and innovating had to be done by the one company that was making the device, right? Then sort of a miracle would have to happen for them to get all of those things right. But if they can create an open ecosystem, then, all they, can, then they can essentially always bring the best of breed thing to their thing. And that's what's happening uh, in the middle of all of this. Okay, so... Oh, Google, how do I love thee? Ah, <laughs> oh, the cloud. Let's try again. <coughs> yes. So what are we doing, what are we changing effectively in the platform and elsewhere to make this possible? Well, the one thing we realized is that the model of software distribution that we have, which, is, which has, I think, been a, a major part of Ubuntu's widespread adoption, is brilliant for developers. Um, uh, and it works really well in cloud-type environments. Something like 70% of the public cloud is running on Ubuntu because that developer experience is great for, for uh, virtual machines and physical machines where you've got professional system administration. But we looked at the cost of administering 
um, Linux servers or Windows servers, and we figured, well, you need at least one system administrator for every thousand servers or VMs that you're managing, at least one. And what that means is that you've put 150 to $200 of management cost effectively, almost invisibly, but 150 to $200 of management cost on every machine. So we started to ask the question, well, how is it going to work if people want to be taking a Raspberry Pi, which is a $30 device, say a, a wireless base station, enterprise wireless base station, somewhere between $100 and $300. Does it make sense to have $150 to $200 of management cost just because you need someone who knows how to administer a Linux system effectively, or a Windows system for that matter, um, to look after those devices? Um, and obviously it doesn't, right? To get the economics to work at the sort of scale that um, um, uh, we expect to see in the Internet of Things, we have to sort of change the operating behavior of the platform to drive that down, to make it much easier and cheaper to operate thousands, tens of thousands, millions of things. If you're a telco, you're going to be operating millions of things, right? Think how many home gateways there are going to be for a, a Telefonica or a Deutsche Telekom or a BT. So we started to look at, that, at, at how we could keep the developer experience of Ubuntu that people like, but enable them to publish apps in a format which would be um, much easier to operate. And we looked at all the things that make it expensive, essentially, to manage a traditional PC or server system. Right? Because the beauty of what's happening is that essentially I can think of this little thing as a server. I can write software for it using all of the normal tools that I would write software to run on a server, right? It's powerful enough that I can treat it just like a server. It's not embedded anymore. It's just, it's just a server, right? So the first thing we did is we um, um, built something called Snapcraft, which is a way of pulling all sorts of pieces of software together into a single sort of bundle that can then be shipped to any system. And the advantage of that approach is that all the things that that software depends on can be encapsulated in that bundle so that um, nothing's going to change unexpectedly for that piece of software, right? What makes it expensive to manage systems is this idea that if I've got lots of software, different so pieces of software on one system, I need to worry about how they fight with each other. So by getting everything um, uh, uh, tied into one bundle effectively, we reduce the amount of that. And it shakes, shakes out, for those of you who are on the engineering side, it shakes out very, very elegantly, right? You essentially say, here's a list of things that I want to bring together into my bundle. You describe it very, very simply. Typically, most of those parts are open source parts that you are reusing or existing Ubuntu packages, for example, that you're reusing. And then there's your own code, effectively, which you just mix in to all of that. And the key thing is this list of parts. Um, in fact, many of those parts are themselves open source and completely reusable. So we try to make it easy for developers to build off each other's work, right? Those of you who, who know Ubuntu know that apt-get is, 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 is a pretty fantastic way to get software. If it's being packaged, then you know, you know that you're getting the same software that everybody else is getting, and so you don't have to worry about it anymore unless there's some particular reason for you to do things differently. What this allows us to do is essentially do give you that same experience for source code. And the reason that's interesting is because if we look at the pace of development, 15 years ago, um, uh, there was only so much open source software out there, right? There was, a, there was a fairly limited supply of it, tens of thousands of pieces of software. If we look at GitHub today, the number of new pieces of software being created there far outstrips anybody's ability to package that up. And in fact, um, because the pace of change is so fast, it's unclear whether it would make sense to package it up because by the time you packaged it up, there'd be a new version. And by the time you had the new version, it would be out of date or something newer would have replaced it, right? So we were thinking a lot about how do we give people access to that source code on GitHub with the same clarity and ease and, and immediacy that you get binaries out of something like AppGet. So this is the mechanism. It lets you mix and match binaries where there are packages with source code straight from the source effectively, build it all together into what we call a snap, which is what gets published into that store. 
Oh, so I often I, I, I ask people sort of question. I'm always interested in in people's gut feel as to what goes faster here. So which comes to consumers first? Autonomous drones. Did you see the Amazon announcement? Pretty cool. What's that? The, the Amazon have put out a, a, a video showing how they intend to do drone delivery. So you, you place an order, you put out a, a kind of a target carpet in your garden, um, and the drone flies there and lands in your backyard with the, with the delivery. So, but of course, that will require a regulatory framework which allows essentially unmanned things to fly over, you know, cities. So that'd be fun. Uh, similarly, this self-driving cars would require a regulatory framework that allows things that can kill people on streets to drive around on the streets. So quick show of hands, who would say that we will see this first? Yeah. And who would say we'll see these first? Don't we see them both at the same time? What's that? <laughs> Depends what you've been smoking, Meg. <laughs> Um, okay, so software, right? Software guys love software. And you can, I think, see how you might sell a thing and then sell apps on top of that, right? And that has great, the apps have great economics, right? The economics of apps are excellent. But even better is um, services, or even better are services. In other words, the ultimate goal I think, for the successful IoT companies, the guys who essentially wa ride this wave of change to disrupt huge industries, will be this. So what do I mean by a service? I mean a subscription. I mean the idea that what you really want is you want someone to put some software on your device and then either purchase things through it, in-app purchases effectively, but much more usefully, sign up to a subscription and actually I think IOT really lends itself to this because ultimately it's going to be very much about the data flow from all of these devices and the service is going to be about managing or understanding or interpreting that data. So what is interesting about this if I think about the economics, um, how much on average would you say you spend on apps on your phone? Very little. Anybody feel like they actually spend a lot on apps? Not content, but on apps. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> um, we don't spend very much on apps, right? Apps for us tend to be much more about sort of short-term engagement or, you know, functions like, you know, your airline boarding pass app. Um, but imagine what you would spend, think for a while, just for yourself, what you'd be willing to spend on an app which cut your electricity usage, right? And or, or imagine the kinds of business models where, that you might have where, f for example, you might be willing to share back with that app some of your savings in energy usage, right? So there's not actually costing you anything. You just set things up and then if it saves you money, you give some of that saving back to the people who, who wrote that, who created that app. So I think there are tremendous business models, first, around the data in IoT that turn into services, um, but more interestingly, the value to human beings of what happens in your house, what happens in your office, what happens in the building, what happens in your fleet, is much, much greater than the, the raw value of the sorts of things uh, or the sorts of engagement that we have with our phones. So our expectation is that this ecosystem is worth far more than the app ecosystem, even though it may echo many of its, many of its features. Um, if you're going to drive a services business, then your number one priority is that people <coughs> stick with the service. So I really like this because essentially it means that the... Um, the interests of the person who provided the device and is providing the services are completely aligned with the interests of the person who's consuming the service, right? Um, uh, uh, planned obsolescence is a horrible thing, right? So if you think about that, what it means is that sometimes if, if, you, if you're selling pressed tin, um, the seller has an interest in that tin sort of expiring so that you come back and buy another set of tin and go fill up a landfill, 
right? But with these sorts of business models, the interests of the people providing the service and the interests of the people who are buying the devices are very, very beautifully aligned because you want to keep your <coughs> users engaged with the service and that means that you focus every day on what will keep them engaged. So I want to talk briefly about what we're doing in Ubuntu as part of this transformation. One is that developer experience story, right? Making source code on GitHub as consumable as binaries, so a source code version of AppGet effectively, and that shrink wrapping of all the bits together into what we call a snap. Um, uh, to reduce the cost of you know, managing Wi-Fi base stations and smart TVs and all of those things, we said, well, the real driver of cost is failure. In other words, if a Wi-Fi base station breaks, then someone has to go and get a ladder and a high-vis vest and fill out a form and there's a health and safety inspection and it's super expensive, right? The telcos talk about rolling a truck as being super expensive. So we said, well, what can we do in the platform to make it so that if something breaks, we can just always revert back to where we were in a known good state. So that's called transactional updates, right? Today, if you have a system and you upgrade, lots of different things happen. And if they all work, yay. And if they don't, you have to go figure out what happened. But you're in an intermediate state, somewhere between when it was working and now it's not, and you've got to figure stuff out. If we could essentially always detect that it didn't work and then just go back to where we were, you'd have kind of a perfect system. It would try to update itself all the time, and if that didn't work, you would, you would at least be not broken. So that's something that we did. Uh, the way that works is, this is a traditional Ubuntu file system, right? Any package can write anywhere, so I install software and install more software, and the pieces of software have to kind of share files, right? Um, in the new version, in what we call Ubuntu Core, we use a different packaging system called Snappy, and these are those big blobs, right? The kernel is one of those big blobs. The entire operating system is one blob. Uh, that means we can update the entire operating system from version one to version two, and if we didn't like that update, we can go back perfectly to version one. There's no intermediate state because we're not kind of copying stuff over other stuff. Uh, and then apps look the same, right? There are, the apps are completely contained. Each of these blobs has its own writable space. That app cannot write anywhere on the system. It can only write to its own space. That means we can, we can give permission for that app to do whatever the hell they like, right? Because we know they can't go anywhere else. They can only stomp on their own toes, effectively. Um, and so you end up with multiple apps on, on a device. This is a big question in robotics. Will the devices that essentially we interact with every day, will they be anthropomorphic or will they be functional? I'm interested, quick show of hands. Who's a, I can never remember, C3PO guy? Who reckons? There will be robots walking around and our, uh, the main, our main experience of robots in the home will be anthropomorphic. Who would say that? They'll, they'll be both. They will be both, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> they will be both, for sure. But, the, but the, this is a really interesting question because, so on the face of it, you know, form follows function, right? So on the face of it, the robots should, should um, uh, look like what they do. But we live in a world which is designed for humans. So there's lots of really interesting research showing that if you had an anthropomorphic robot that could vacuum the house, that would actually be much more powerful because it can open doors. Doors designed for anthropomorphic shaped things, right? Okay, so you're all C3PO people, fine. Um, one last thought in terms of the business models. There is a sort of a meme that says, hey, it's all about the data. Get all the data, grab as much data as you like, you know, and never let go, never delete the data, right? Um, data is a liability, right? And we start to see that, we start to see that today, that you really need to understand what you're going to do with that data, and you really need to invest in protecting that data, because if you do that badly, it's a liability. Um, Here's a whole bunch of disaster stories. Most recently, this one. Right. These smart toy manufacturers who aren't so smart, right, <laughs> ended up with a huge liability because they effectively didn't think about security. So this is why I think it's really important for us to make platforms where we take care of those basic things like the security of update mechanisms, the security of the data. I think it's going to be 
if you're going to ship stuff out into the world, it's going to be really important that you can say, look, this stuff will get updated. When there's a security issue, <laughs> I don't have to worry about that because it's part of a common platform. Because the entire OS is a separate snap, effectively, in this new model, we can update the OS without touching anybody's application data or application files. And there are mechanisms for the app to tell us if that, app, if that update effectively broke the app. So we, can, we have a much cleaner, more, more effective relationship. Okay, my final question. Um, oh, so, thank you. So the, 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 the last point about all of this is that the vendors of those different apps on this robot shouldn't be able to see each other's data. Like, just because I installed two apps on the same device doesn't mean that I want them to be able to see each other's data. So the last point in the way we reshape the platform is that each of these apps is in its own space. They literally don't know that the other app exists. They can't see the other app. They have no idea what data that app is managing. And that's really important because if you think of your phone, your engagement with apps sometimes is really trivial. You heard about it, it sounded fun, so you installed it, right? That app shouldn't have access to sensitive data. So this is a thing that we can do in this new world that we never used to be able to do in the old world because we now know where every app is supposed to be writing its data. Okay, one last question. In the robot era, should sex with robots be legal? <laughs> yes? No? Who says yes? <laughs> That's what Ethereum is for. It'll be a bit a blockchain contract. <laughs> so, <laughs> it might be in some households. So, it's only a, it's only partially in, in jest, right? Because if we look at the history of technology, right, it's amazing what drives platforms. It's amazing what drives technology adoption, entertainment is a huge thing. So one of the areas that we're very focused on at the moment is something called the Internet of Toys, right? To me, the Internet of Things is kind of clinical, but the Internet of Toys, I think, is really, really rich. Um, we can innovate much faster with things that can't kill people or are unlikely to kill people, right? So that's the last thing I would say is, you know, this is going to be a space that moves incredibly fast. And so, while it's exciting to sort of think about doing a, a self-driving car or something like that, that's a 10-year project. And by the time it's done, many of the standards, many of the um, ecosystem effects will already have been settled, right? For the guys who produce cars in five, 10 years' time, they may have no choice but to use platforms which have already solved a bunch of the problems that toys and other forms of entertainment uh, did very early in the process. And I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much.